So we're going to be taking donations for a bus and um, get these girls on the road. Thank you all so much for that wonderful song. And uh, just love the staff kids getting together and singing and using their talents for the Lord. What a tremendous blessing. I don't want to take up any of his time because I know he's all charged up after that. So uh, we're going to ask Brother Turner to come and preach the word of God to us. Give him another good grace and Bible Baptist welcome as he comes to preach. Thank you, preacher. Wow. You know, I'm expecting a typical little girls group thing, you know, and boom! I mean, that's the kind of excitement we need in our churches right there, amen? That, that's good. Wow, praise the Lord, that was just unbelievable. God is big enough, amen? He's big enough for any challenges that we have. I'm thankful that he is big enough. I enjoyed that a lot. I enjoyed uh, all the music and I enjoyed the, the piano and the organ. I, I looked over at Timothy and I thought, slow down, boy, you're going to have whiplash here if you don't watch it there. I mean, I think I was going to have to go over there and give him some first aid, you know. And, uh, and boy, Brother Stephen, what a good presentation. I've had the privilege of being in Kenya and, and uh, wow, just uh, what the need is just beyond anything you can describe. Uh, I thought I understood missions uh, as a pastor, and I found out <clears throat> that uh, until I actually visited the mission field, I didn't really get the vision. And uh, I'd encourage you with your pastor's uh, help and approval, if you're able to make a trip to the mission field, you'll come home totally uh, changed. You'll come home changed. And I, I came back from Kenya very much uh, changed. I, I remember being in Nairobi and just, uh, how many millions in Nairobi alone? Five million. And uh, then the Rift Valley there, very poor area. You look down at the cardboard uh, houses down in the valley there and, and uh, then go over to Eldoret and all the little villages. And, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, it moved me for missions many, many years ago. And so I know he's going to do a good job there. He has the right personality. And let me just tell you, the kids are, uh, they're, they're almost destitute for any kind of attention in Kenya. Am I right, uh, Brother Stephen? And he'll be like a magnet to them. He really will. And God will use him in a great way. So I'm thankful he's here today, and he uh, was also a blessing to my heart. Thank you, church, for your kindness. I add my thanks to you for the good room and for uh, the provision, for the fellowship. It's just been absolutely uh, a wonderful day. Take your Bibles one more time. Uh, we'll not be long tonight. Of course, you you know uh, that's one of the lies a preacher gives, right? Uh, kind of like I'm from the IRS and I'm here to help you, you know? Uh, or I gave at the office. <laughs> sure you did. Sure you did. Uh, or turn to the text. We'll only be a few minutes. But we will, honestly, be a few minutes tonight. You know, I, I've, I, the older I get, the more I realize that it, you know, it's just good to get up, kind of like the girls just did, and hit it, and drive the point home. And, and uh, the more and more I quit trying to drive home several nails in one sermon and just drive one home, try to get us to get that thought if we can. And so back in our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not even actually going to uh, read a lot of scripture here. We'll read it as we uh, go tonight. But this morning, I talked to you about uh, giving beyond our power, allowing God to do in our lives what we cannot uh, do for ourselves. And I said uh, that they submitted themselves to the will of God. I pray that if you have not yet done that, uh, you'll do that. I met a young man who told me that he's, Surrendered his life to be a preacher and going off uh, to Heartland. <clears throat> that excites me. I wanted, I wanted to preach another message tonight from Acts chapter 13 about how God uh, takes from within the church to uh, do his work. Uh, man, that's just exciting. So we need to submit to God. Then we talked about uh, committing to growing uh, in grace. I hope uh, if you didn't make a trip to the altar and make some kind of commitment to the Lord this morning that you'll at least commit right where you're at right now, that you 
will grow in grace, that you'll do more for God this year than you have ever uh, done before, that you will be always abounding in the work of the Lord. And then lastly, that you'll never forget the commitment Christ gave us when he was rich, but for our sakes he became poor. I try to read through uh, the crucifixion story fairly often to remind myself of what Christ uh, did for me. I was actually in an airport uh, some time back, oh, maybe six months or so ago, and uh, my leg situation, I'd you know, had uh, the hip surgery, knee surgery, and then a broken leg, and I was suffering a little bit. I was sitting there in the airport feeling sorry for myself, and it just came to my mind, you know what, this doesn't compare to what the Savior endured. And I began to pray and say, Lord, uh, my pain is insignificant uh, to what you endured on the cross. I want to remember that and be able to keep serving you and serve through the pain and, and through the difficulty. So um, make sure that you remind yourself of that all the time. Now tonight I want to give you four quick principles uh, that we can use in our life uh, to be good givers. And I'm talking now primarily giving financially to the work of God. I know this is an awesome, awesome church in missions giving. I know that, and I'm grateful for that. But what I used to say at Westgate Baptist Church all the time was, good churches can be better. And good givers can give more. And if we do that, we seize that principle that what we give, God returns back to us many, many times over. Uh, what a wonderful truth that is. Let me give you four thoughts tonight. First of all, the principle of giving by uh, equality. Chapter 8 and verse number 13. For I mean not <clears throat> that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality. I'm not going to go deep into the text here, but just say this to you tonight. Everybody needs to be involved in giving. Amen? You know, if we could just get over that hump, that uh, those who are giving give more to missions, those who aren't giving start somewhere. Amen? They start somewhere and uh, begin to give, and that no one have to carry uh, most of the burden, having pastored uh, a long, long time, I can tell you that a, a small percentage, maybe 20% uh, of God's people do about 90% of the work around uh, the church and, and ought not be so. There ought to be an equality of involvement and burden. Everyone here needs to feel the burden of this young man tonight. Amen? It shouldn't be just a few who are giving. It should have seized all of our hearts tonight, and it should make us to understand that we must be equally involved. Now, in tithing, it ought to be a done deal. In the tithe is the Lord's, amen? And, and for the tithe, it ought to just be a simple fact. Everybody gives uh, the tithe unto the Lord. The truth is, though, uh, that a recent poll says that only 10 to 20% uh, people give faithfully in the local church, and listen to this, that it's not a tithe, but approximately 2.5% of their income. The tithe is the Lord. Say that with me. The tithe is the Lord's. And so everybody ought to be doing that. But there's so much that needs to be done uh, beyond the tithe. You know, the Bible says, uh, wherein have you robbed me? You've robbed me in tithes, uh, and in offerings. I had a guy attack me once at Westgate. He said, you said this morning that I was a thief if I didn't give my tithe. I said, no, that's not what I said. You misunderstood me. He said, well, then what did you say? I said, I believe you're a thief if you don't give your tithe and your offerings. I'm a little nicer now than I used to be. Gotten a little bit Here's the truth of the matter. If God seizes your heart and says, hey, I want you to give this to missions, it's his, amen. It's his. We ought to give it. And it ought, there ought to be an equality in that burden. Well, I think our church ought to be a missionary church. Well, then get on board. Get on board and give because the more the church gives, the more they can send around the world uh, to reach the world 
uh, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the truth is tonight, it embarrasses me how little of the world we have won for Christ. I, I'm going through some things now, you know, with health, I, I, I'm not able to travel internationally as much as I was, and, and it bugs me and it burdens me because I want to be there, and I want to preach. So I've been doing some instruction on the, on, uh, the internet with a couple of young preachers and trying to fire them up and show them how to do some work. I'm working with uh, different people here and there and trying to encourage them, but I'm going to do what I can uh, to affect missions. And let me tell you, when we get a love offering, I don't care if it's $100 or if it's $1,000, the first thing we do is separate, separate our tithe out to God, separate our missions out to God, and give God what belongs to Him first. Amen? And so giving uh, out of equality. No one in the church ought to carry the, the gas bill or, or the electric bill or the air conditioning bill. And no one person in the church ought to carry uh, the, the expenses of sending people around the world. It ought to be the heart of everybody, amen? I know in some churches there are some mega donors, and I always warn the young pastors, be careful that you don't put all your support in a mega donor, and, and then uh, they withdraw and you have no missions program. Teach your people to give out of equality, amen? Number one, principle of giving out of equality. Number two, the principle of what I call of harvest or gathering. Look in chapter number eight and verse number 15. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. The principle is that God is the one, as we saw in Sunday school this morning, who delivered unto his servants his goods. So God is the God of harvest. He's the one uh, that blesses us. How many of you say tonight, God's blessed me? Say amen. amen. God's blessed me. I'll, I'll tell you, he has blessed my wife and I. And we're thankful uh, for his giving. Now, you know what? Um, we uh, live from love offering and social security. It'd be very easy for us to say, well, we got to put this away and we got to put that away and we got to do this and, and we got to do that. Uh, but the truth is, God is the one who gives to us. He is the one who supplies us. And is, if we are faithful to God, God will keep that supply going in our life. Mark that down. Now, now hear what I'm saying. There, there is a tendency uh, for all of us to keep things that we have. That, that's a normal thing. I, my grandfather lived to be one day short of 105. And uh, I saw him not long before he died. And I said, Pop, do you have any, uh, you, you know, any regrets? And he said, yes, I do. He said, I, I hoarded my time and did not go to church like I should, and I hoarded my money and didn't give to the things of God and only wish I could go back and do better now. Well, we're not going to get a second chance after we're out of this life. Let's do what's right, and let's give out of the abundance that God gives to us. And here's the principle. I mean, you can stack it up as high as you want, but listen, God's going to get his tithe. He's going to get it some way, amen? And, and those that do that end up with just having very little uh, uh, supply. In fact, uh, was it Haggai chapter 1? says it's like going around with a bag full of money, but the bag has a hole in it, and the money keeps escaping, and you get where you're going, you look in, and it's empty. Well, that's the principle of, of the harvest, when you think you're in charge of the harvest. But it reminds me of that rich young farmer. You remember? Uh, oh, my barns are full. Tear down the barn and build a bigger barn. And they did that. But he wasn't counting on the fact that God said, Tonight thy soul shall be required of thee. I'll tell you this. Uh, what a great opportunity we have now while we're standing upright and breathing to honor God with our life. Amen? Oh, give to the Lord. So the principle of equality in our giving, the principle of gathering the harvest and allowing God to have what belongs to him. And then thirdly, the principle of sowing and reaping. Look at chapter 9 and verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap 
also bountifully the law of sowing and reaping. Two things, I have much I can say here, but two things tonight. Only what you sow is what you will reap. You will not reap of many kinds. You will only reap of the kind that you sow. Now, I live in farm country all around me. In fact, our house is kind of up on a hill. And I sit uh, on the swing on the tree there and have my coffee some mornings and some evenings, have my devotions out there. And I look out over that valley right now. Uh, it is just fertile. Corn and beans and some of them just took up hay and some, some uh, have uh, wheat planted and they'll be taking that up soon. And I, I look at that, I look at all of that, and I think, you know, what a lesson of life that is. Th those farmers, you know, do you know now many of those farmers, everything's done by GPS. I don't know if you're aware of that. They get in those big fancy buggies and they hit the GPS and all they have to do is sit there and it'll do the 100 acres or whatever. I mean, it just does it by GPS. One thing, though, they have to be sure of is they put seed in, in the, their, their cedar. They have to be sure that it's seed. And if they're, if they're planting corn, and this year was particularly important because uh, with what's going on in the war in Ukraine and other things, wheat prices have gone off the map. And so many, many farmers changed at the last minute to uh, plant uh, wheat and so they could get a better payday. And so, you know, they had to go out there and put that. I actually saw an old man out in the field, and he's dumping that seed into that planter. And the truth is, it doesn't matter what he says. He can plant all of that and come back and say, well, I planted wheat today, but I think, I think I'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, harvest corn. It doesn't work that way. We can only harvest what we plant. And I'll tell you this, we can only harvest the amount we plant. You ever see a farmer go out in the middle of the 100 acres and put just two or three little seeds of corn in the middle of, the, of that 100 acres and then go sit down and wait for the corn to grow and say, I do not understand why I only have a few stalks of corn. What in the world could have gone wrong? Well, I'll tell you what went wrong. He didn't plant enough corn. And some of us are sitting in the church saying, oh, I want all the blessings of God and I don't know what went wrong. We haven't planted enough in the harvest for God. Amen? Oh, let me encourage you tonight uh, to give because we reap what we sow. I'm thankful that I've been faithful in my giving since Miss Reva and I were 18 years old. We got married at 18. We just celebrated 54 years together. And I'm going to tell you, uh, we were sitting the other day talking about this. That first trial came, and it was tempting not to give because we weren't sure how we were going to pay a bill. Uh, but God uh, in encouraged us to be faithful, and we did. And, and God blessed us, and the bill got paid anyhow. And, and by the very company we owed the bill to, it's Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and they profit shared, and we were able to pay the bill uh, from what they gave us. And, and we were talking the other day and thinking, we have no regrets. God has always paid us back more than we've ever given to the work of God. Oh, listen, you want to be blessed? I think everybody wants to be blessed, amen? You want to be blessed? Listen, so bountifully, amen? And watch God bless you. Watch God bless you. And then lastly tonight, principle number four, the principle of all sufficiency. Look in chapter nine, <clears throat> verse seven. Every man, he says, is to give as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And I want to stop right there before I make my point. Can I say to you the best I know that all these years I've been giving to God, I've never put my offering in the plate and wanted to take it back. The best I know. I've never thought, oh, you know, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. I did it. Honey, I'm sorry, I did it. I've never felt like that. I've always thought it belongs to God. And I'm glad to give it. And God, more than am I glad to give it, I trust you 
to take care of me. Now what does he say here? Look, he says in verse number 9, or verse number 8, and God is able. How many of you believe tonight God's able? Amen. Amen. And God is able, not you, not your calculations, not your good planning, not your economic degree, none of that. God is able, amen? <clears throat> What's he able to do? To make all grace abound toward you, that ye are always having all sufficiency in all things. What's all mean? means all. God said, I'm going to make all grace abound in all things. I'm going to be all sufficient in your life. I'm going to take care of you. When you learn to give that way and trust God, I'm telling you, it is exciting. Amen? It is exciting to see uh, what God can do. Let me give you this illustration and we'll pray. So, I went to the doctor back uh, in the spring and uh, the orthopedic doctor and after having a hip done, knee done, broken leg. And he said, man, I don't know what to tell you. My, my leg is so swollen, I can't, still can't bend my knee much. Makes it difficult to get in and out of the car and walk and, and do those things. And the doctor's so frustrated. And so they said, well, we're going to try one more thing. We're going to send you to therapy a second time. I did that and finished that two weeks ago. And the therapist said, well, he said... Uh, you know, tell you the truth, it didn't help much. And he said, I wouldn't recommend you continue doing it. Just exercise at home. But I don't think you need to keep coming here. And, and uh, so in order to do that, we had to be home all summer. I sent out, uh, well, I didn't send it out. Uh, our, the guy that runs our state fellowship sent out a little note, said, Brother Turner's available for uh, several weeks. And we got two or three calls out of that, and that was it. So we had a lot of down Sundays. One by one, God filled those up, and there were three or four that didn't get filled up. And so, you know, I'm the nervous sort. You know that little chorus, why worry when you can pray? Well, I'm kind of like, why pray when you can worry? That's my personality. But God's teaching me, right? And I said to my wife, how's, how's the budget going? She said, it's amazing. I don't know how, but everything's current. Everything's current. I was telling Pastor Roy, and I, I went to church, and one of the deacons said, uh, how, you, how you guys doing? You need any help? It always embarrasses me. I, I told him I didn't know what I was supposed to say. Well, I do need a little help. I, I could use an F-150 Ford. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what you're supposed to say. My daddy told me never to ask for things, and so we don't. I, and I, I think spiritually that's a right man. I, I preached that last Wednesday night at Whittier Lane, talked about it. On Thursday, I was just sitting, getting ready, getting my stuff ready to travel to um, Salina, Ohio to preach with Brother Phil Clayton, or not Phil Clayton, Steve Clayton, and, uh, and my phone rang, and it was a preacher. And he said... Uh, well, Turner, I need to apologize to you. And I thought, hell, here's another one that's heard some gossip. He said, no, I, I, I need to apologize. He said, back at the end of the spring, right at the beginning of summer, he said, God spoke to my heart and told me that I ought to take an offering up and help you all. And he didn't know that we were going to be home for the summer. He didn't know anything about that. He just said, God talked to him about it. And he said, I got... I got distracted. I said, well, I know you did. I, he, he was in the hospital for three weeks with COVID and almost died. I mean, he was sick. And I said, preacher, you've had your own battle. Don't worry about it. He said, but listen, he said, I'm not calling to ask if you need help because I know you, you could use a little help because God told me to send this. And he said, it's in the mail. And we actually got it, I think, the next day. A nice love offering. We didn't ask for that. I didn't go on Facebook and say, please pray for us. We're really having a hard summer. Or please pray. I've got an unspoken request, but you can call me and ask me what it is if you want. <laughs> I get so sick of some of these people traveling around in the name of Jesus that are so destitute, right? I need a, I need a new fifth wheel. You know, come on. 
God knows every need we have. I'm just saying, don't be afraid to give generously. Don't, don't think that God won't take notice of what you gave. If he takes notice of a sparrow that falls, if he takes notice of the number of hairs or lack thereof on my head, he can take care of Bruce Turner. He can take care of you. And I want to just say to you tonight, let's determine by the grace of God that we will give out of an equality. Let's decide that we will give out of the harvest God gives us and let God give us a bigger harvest rather than us trying to build bigger barns. Let's determine uh, tonight by the grace of God uh, that we will sow bountifully. Amen. Not a little bit. You say, but where do I start? Well, talk to preacher. Let him encourage you. But start somewhere, amen? Start somewhere. Man, all of my grandkids, all of them we've taught not only to separate their tithe, but determine what God wants to do with them in missions and give to missions also. Amen? And determine that when you do that, you will never have to worry about provision because God is able. Amen? God is able. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Thank you for being so very, very kind and for giving good attention. I'm going to ask pastors to come take the invitation tonight. Dismiss us. God bless you. Thanks for letting me be here uh, today. I love this church. I love your pastor. I love what God's doing here. May God increase the harvest here in this church. Amen. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, and we're so grateful for the word that's been expounded, Lord, the word that's been explained, and uh, just a reminder that we've had in our hearts and lives tonight that you are big enough and you are uh, never, never ever a debtor to anyone that will get involved in faith promise missions and giving of their offerings and their tithes. And Lord, the, men, the tremendous amount of blessings and things that you've done in my life came to my mind as he was preaching. And Lord, we know that many in here in this room can look back on their lives and know when they had a trial and a step of faith and they gave anyways and God blessed in tremendous ways. Would you help us to be faithful to that? Help us to increase uh, the harvest and the giving that we're doing. Help us to do it bountifully. And Lord, if there's one here that is not involved in faith promise missions or giving of their offerings or even of their tithe, would you encourage them and just help them to step out and as you said in your word, to try you and see if you won't deliver. Lord, we love you tonight and we praise you for the message. Pray that it speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.